helping Her Excellency Dr. Carla Barnett, Secretary General of CARICOM, Mr. Neil Corbin, President of the Small Business Association, Senator Dr. Lynette Holder, CEO of the Small Business Association of Barbados, members of the executive of the Small Business Association, Dr. Maharaj, Executive Director of Caribbean Export, um, ladies and gentlemen all. Um, beyond the alliterative appeal of this year's theme, I wanted to congratulate you, Mr. President, on what I consider to be a most appropriate and apt um, selection. This theme speaks directly to some of the issues that are confronting not just this economy of Barbados, but the wider Caribbean. And permit me, if you will, at the very beginning, Mr. President, to reflect a little bit on the fact that within this CARICOM basin are to be found some of the most travel dependent, trade dependent and direct foreign, foreign exchange um, investment dependent um, countries on planet Earth. And the importance of building resilience in these economies, quite frankly, is manifested by the fact that these economies of CARICOM are disproportionately lacking in capacity to deal with some of the sharp shocks and challenges similar to that which we have confronted during the course of the last year, year and a half, as a result of the COVID-induced environment. I, I say that and invite you to reflect on a bit of data that I will share with you. The United Nations World Trade Organization in the year 2020 reflected that global tourism arrivals had fallen in that year by 8%. In the wider CARICOM region, however, that reflected a fall of 70%, 70. In global terms, that 8% reduction in, uh, in tourism related travel resulted in a 4% decline in economic activity across the world. In CARICOM, however, that 70% reduction in travel, tourism related travel, resulted in double digit uh, decreases in our gross domestic product. So that countries like St. Kitts reflected a 19% decline, Antigua, a 17% decline in GDP, St. Lucia, a 17% decline in GDP, and in Barbados, we recorded a 15% decline in our GDP. And this disproportionate impact and fragility born out of our travel dependency reveals the extent of the need for us to be speaking the language of resilience. The evidence in terms of the trade induced aspects of our resilience is no less poignant. I've had to say in recent times that this country spends over $500 million a year importing fossil fuels because of that, that at present, and it will change by 2030, but that at present is the way in which Barbados drives its industry, drives its businesses. Now, the fact of the matter is that on the international market between January um, and today, the cost of the importation of fossil fuel has risen by 70% once again. And that obviously has a knock-on impact for customers um, of your businesses, and indeed it has a knock-on impact for your businesses as well. Equally, with respect to the circumstances we have for importing um, those things that make our businesses work, that make our operations and industry successful. Very often we have to source product from out of Asia. And an empty container, an empty container being sourced out of Asia today, whereas before in 2018, 2019, a same container would have costed 2000 US dollars, perhaps on, based on the size of it, going as high as 3,500 US dollars those containers today are costing us 12,000, 15,000, and at my most recent check, some in excess of 20,000 US dollars. That is before the container has been stuffed 
with, 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 with commodities to bring into this region. So the message from these scenarios, ladies and gentlemen, I think is crystal clear. Our trade reliance and travel um, induced, travel reliance and travel induced um, fragility born out of the COVID environment has been laid bare for all to see. And therefore, I have no difficulty in associating myself, Mr. President, as I said at the beginning, with the theme which you have um, put out here for us to reflect upon. Um, and it goes far beyond just its alliterative appeal. I think it is exceptionally important and telling. But having agreed with the central premise of that theme, what then are, um, are the solutions? And what does resilience look like? I cannot posit to you as minister that I hold all of the solutions in the palm of my hand or at the top of my head. But I think that if I had to within the 20 minutes allotted to me to speak to a few of those, I would have to begin with the question of, or, or recognizing the fact that there are a few pillars which we must erect in order to bridge this gulf between where we are today and a stronger, more resilient economy tomorrow. Um, the first of those would be the question of standards. And I think this country now has to be prepared to wed itself firmly um, to the development of standards. I say that because we are price takers. We are never going to be manufacturing and producing enough or offering as much services to the world as to be able to set prices globally. But what we can do is to compete successfully on a platform of standards. And for me, that is the, the departure point in this conversation. As Minister responsible for commerce in this country, I've secured the imprimatur of the Cabinet of Barbados for the Barbados National Standards Institute to create a national quality committee. And that national quality committee, as I said, will be under the auspices of the National Standards Institute, but it will be mandated to have a developmental focus of shaping standards and shaping uh, technical rules and regulations across all sectors of this economy. Simply put, from the water sports operator to the construction magnet, their business must be done in accordance with certain best practices and in accordance with certain standards. And why is this important? It is important because regulations, technical regulations and standards are essentially that common tide that lifts all ships onto an ocean of competitiveness. It is an investment, in other words, um, which we are going to be making with a view to making sure that our companies or enterprises, firms are more competitive coming out of the COVID environment than they have been going in. Under the rules of international trade, I need not state the obvious. It is impossible to secure market access unless you are able to demonstrate that the goods that you are selling into my marketplace have been made in accordance with certain regulations and certain standards. Equally, the same thing is true of the exportation of services. So key to market access is the discussion on standards. But what we have often found is that too many of our micro and small businesses have not been subjected to the rigor uh, and, and, and the robust reflection internally in terms of their business dynamic internally as they prepare to move from a micro platform to a small platform to a medium platform to an export level platform when once you come to the export stage you should be in a position where you're familiar with standards where you understand the challenge and the rigor where you have been subjected to it and have tried it in your domestic marketplace where you have understood what you need to do when you stumble when you fall when you have failed to meet appropriate standards how you put yourself back together and remain competitive for it to begin as it now does far too often at the stage of an export level is for us to put pitfalls in the way of people who are now entering that export stage in circumstances where they're utterly and entirely unprepared to deal with it. 
And we feel that that is something that has to be corrected as we try to shape a more developmental path for our businesses. Equally, reaching an export level platform cannot, however, any longer be treated as a matter of serendipity. And my ministry feels that the Barbados National Standards Institute must be that vehicle that now partners with micro and small businesses in Barbados on a day by day basis, so as to ensure that there is born out of that partnership, a better understanding of how you, you traverse and navigate the, the, the economic landscape with a view to avoiding pitfalls and making yourself more competitive. I feel that I must say this as I close on the question of standards. When I became minister, I was startled to become aware of the fact that the companies and the firms in Barbados, which could constitute and properly be called small and micro businesses, may have numbered around 9,000 or so. But the reality is that in terms of clientele of the Barbados National Standards Institute, in terms of being partners with the National Standards Institute and having a relationship, a working relationship with this critical developmental institute in the country, institution in the country, there may have been fewer than 65 who were in that capacity. And that simply cannot be good enough. And the fact that that is the accurate statistic tells the tale of the work that we need to do in this aspect of making ourselves more reliant. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I perhaps have to go against a little bit of advice that I was given because it was pointed out to me that minister, you know, the, the financial community in part is part of the sponsorship of this state of the sector conference. And maybe there are some things that you can't say. And I hasten to say, Madam CEO and Mr. President, that I will not trespass on goodwill and good behavior. But there are some things about which it is impossible to remain silent if we're going to have a serious conversation about resilience. And one of those areas really is the conversation that I think we have to have in our business on the, the, the Easy of access to credit, credit. Constraint access to credit, credit. This is in my judgment one of the issues which which lead to economic fragility, especially in this micro and small business sector. A conversation about resilience, in my judgment, cannot seriously and in good faith take place in the absence of a focus on credit, because credit is an indispensable aspect of economic growth, not only in this country, but across the world, and it is an indispensable aspect of private sector development. Having said that, I believe genuinely that this is not a... a, 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 a an area that one has to be overly guarded in discussing because Barbados had a jobs and investment committee um, forum last year when this issue was put squarely before the country. But if we are going to be faithful to truth, then we have to look each other in the eye and say that progress since then has not been satisfactory. Um, it is in this regard that I believe that the unavailability of assets that is the excuse that I am given, that there's an unavailability of assets. I don't think that that holds water. Um, our problem, in my judgment, is that there has been an inability of the legal framework of Barbados, and yes, a lack of administrative will in some circumstances to facilitate those assets that we do have. And I take fortitude in this position from reflecting on a World Bank report, which looked at the circumstances confronting developing countries around the world, not just this region, but globally. And that report was able to reflect that as much as 80% of the capital stock of small and micro businesses globally is held in immovable um, it, sorry, in movable assets, those things that can be moved around. And that only 20% of the capital stock globally for micro and small enterprise is really in bricks and mortar and real estate. Now, it tells me therefore that globally, there, ha there has been an understanding that this is an issue. 
And it is self-evident as a proposition for me that this situation has to be rectified. My ministry has been working with Impact Justice and the University of the West Indies at Cave Hill to develop a movable assets or collateral registry, um, which would allow medium, small and micro enterprises to register um, on a web-based technological platform, register charges and collateral, which are offered by borrowers to secure credit facilities, which are offered by lenders. But to get to that point, obviously, is a heroic undertaking. Um, the institution would, this institution would provide for the recognition and usage of a wider scope of assets in Barbados. And that, in my judgment, is where we have to go to build out a wider scope of assets in this country. And permit me, please, to be absolutely frank about this point. For too long, I think the entrepreneurial impulse of the micro and small business people of this country has been blunted by the cry that they are unable to access loans and unable to access capital. Um, for most micro and small entrepreneurs, they may not be able to present to a financial institution title deeds for real estate, but what they do have are accounts receivable. What they do have, in many cases, intellectual property rights. They, in many cases, have vehicles, they have plant, they have equipment, they have livestock. All of these assets have value. All of those assets can, in other parts of the world, be registered and used as collateral. And I think the time has come for us in Barbados. If we are serious about having a conversation about resilience, we have to be prepared to take that next step and break the shackles of economic disqualification, which hold back and restrain the entrepreneurial impulse of our business people in this country. I feel very strongly that that time has come and, um, and, and that this is a core part of the discussion that we must have going forward. And even as we have to confront the fact that our real estate deprived entrepreneurs cannot continue to be viewed with a jaundiced eye by those who inhabit the corridors of financial privilege and power in this country, we equally have to be prepared to recognize that more and more must continue to be done to ensure the financial education um, of our entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs. Because that educational process, I think, is key to us unlocking the doors of economic opportunity in this country and building an inclusive and a resilient economy. And that would be the third pillar on which I would premise my remarks. In November of 2020, we launched, my ministry launched a financial literacy bureau in response to our concern that, as I just said, there were several Barbadians who need to be equipped or better equipped with financial know-how, not just to be conversant, but to be able to be comfortable in the practice of running a business enterprise. And, and, and I want to, to break away from the, the formality of the, the construct and invite you just to think about it a little bit. A lady who previously was a waitress has a bad accident, but is compensated and comes away with $250,000. And she says, I am going to start my own business. I'm not working for anybody again. A laudable, a laudable approach but she has never been trained in the management of this business that she wants to start upon. She has the entrepreneurial impulse, but then is confronted with some fundamentals, which may be basic in the eyes of those of us who have been exposed a little bit more, but are potential snares and pitfalls for all of those who are in her capacity now beginning to take this journey. We can't allow her to fail, but at the same time, we have to be prepared to help her to understand what are accounts receivable, what are accounts payable, how are they managed? Do not tell me that that is an elementary thing because I come from a profession which has 
explain to the world here in Barbados that that is not all the, always well managed. Um, and that is at a professional level. I go further. There have to be an understanding of how mortgages and debentures work. There must be an understanding of pricing strategies, how these work, when and how they should be deployed. These are some of the issues that our people must be able to become attuned to and, and to be comfortable with. And I feel again that if we are going to come out of the COVID environment with resilient entrepreneurs, then those persons who are in the entrepreneurial class or entering the entrepreneurial class must be at all stages supported in this journey of gaining um, and increasing their degree of financial knowledge. And again, that is not an achievement that comes about by way, friends, of serendipity. It requires a conscious effort because too many small businesses have failed and too many small businesses have fallen by the wayside and too many opportunities have been missed for us to have the building out of a, on the solution of another problem, building out the solution of another problem. And that is the creation of intergenerational wealth in this country. Um, and we can't continue for that to be an issue. So um, without trespassing too much deeply um, into the time frame allotted, I want to speak to the other pillar. And that perhaps is very closely indexed to the question of standards, but is really wholly about plugging loopholes in this matter of the cost of living in this country. I started by saying that we are price takers. We don't set prices. But the fact that we do not set prices does not mean that we are tied and have been rendered impotent in defending ourselves or that we can't compete more efficiently or equally that we cannot build out efficiency within the domestic framework in such a way as to make sure that we protect our domestic players from imported um, levels of inflation. Now, I, I, I want to say to you that in every country which takes its internal commerce seriously, there is a system of measurement, uh, national measurement, which constitutes calibration facilities. It constitutes uh, a network of laboratories. It constitutes accreditation systems. And that is really called your system of metrology. Metrology is really a mechanism which is utilized by countries to blunt the cost of inefficiency and to promote efficiency as well. But systems of metrology therefore obviously have wide ranging impact on an economy. And, and this is nothing new. From as far back as perhaps 2,900, I can't remember the history or 3,000 BC, the, the, the first system of measurement was created that's known to mankind, which was the cubit. And it was the length of Pharaoh's arm plus the span of his palm. From then until now, every country has sought to conduct its economic activity within the context of defined systems of measurement. What's the significance of this to the small and micro players in this country? The significance of it lies in the fact that in a modernized economy, it is necessary for us to have a regulatory framework of metrology, which ensures that in terms of quality of measurements, we are at best practice stage. It ensures that with, in terms of certainty and quality of control of calibration of instruments of measurement, we are at best practice stage. It, it, it ensures, for example, that the pest control operator, Mr. President, who is a member of the Small Business Association and must crisscross this island, either he himself or those employees of his with his four vehicles that he's invested in, that he is getting when he goes to the fuel pump in Barbados, he is paying for a liter of gas and not getting instead nine tenths or eight tenths of a liter. It ensures that the agricultural, um, the farmer, the, the, the retailer who is going to trade a 20 pound bag of onions is trading a 20 pound bag of onions and not 19 pound bag of onions. And at every stage where we don't get the measurement right, there is a knock-on effect for the consumer. Might I remind you in case you forget, 
that some of the major consumers in this country are the micro and small business people who have to purchase input to their business. And every time you pay for a loss, pay for a negligent transaction, an inaccurate mechanism of measurement, you then add to the cost of doing business at the output end and build up more and more inefficiency. My ministry accepts that even as price takers, there are some things that you can do. And one of the things that we have to do in my judgment has been to provide this country with a robust mechanism for doing its, its metrology. Um, we have done a new metrology act. I can say to you that it has passed the chief parliamentary council's scrutiny. It now is on its way to the attorney general office of, Bar office of the attorney general of Barbados for his certificate of readiness and fitness to be laid in parliament. Once that bill is debated and passed into law, Mr. President, we would have taken another step towards containing costs, creating greater certainty in business operation and protection of consumers in this country. Uh, and again, I think that that is another important component part of building the resilience of the wider market. I, I, wish I wish that I got it on, but I'm sensitive to the consequence of time. But I think, but I think that this conversation, conversation is an essential one. one. Last, last time I was here, Mr. President, I invited you, and, and not, well, not you, your predecessor. And, and, and if I want to issue that, that, that invitation again, I think, I think that this country and this sector can benefit from uh, a point halfway through the year where we take stock of some of the progress that we have made during the year and we sit down together and we, 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 we apply our hearts to reason with each other and that we come away with an understanding of what we have failed to do, what we need to do in order to keep all four wheels of the carriage on track. I believe that to have a second bite of this cherry not necessarily with this level of aplomb, but a genuine sit down with the wider sector. It is not often that ministers of government invite scrutiny upon themselves, but I am doing so now. And I am saying to you that this minister wants to hear from you, not only at the end of a year, but during the year, halfway through, this minister is here, willing to hear what your concerns are, where we are failing you, how we can help you in the case of this theme to be more resilient and how we can be more re uh, resourceful as we tread this pathway towards recovery. I wish to uh, thank you for bearing with me and I want to thank you for um, inviting me here. I want to wish you an excellent conference and I pledge to you that I will spend the rest of the day being an attentive and interested participant.